Culture of the Teutons Chapter 1 Frith The historians of the 17th and 18th centuries had one great advantage. They felt themselves as citizens of the world. They were never strangers to their subject matter, and knew nothing of that shyness which the stranger always feels. They felt themselves at home throughout the inhabited world. At any rate, so long as they remained in their own country, or the lands immediately adjacent. In a bodily sense, and made all further journeyings in spirit alone. They did not sit fumbling over their material, but went straight to the person's concern, whether men of the immediate past or those of earliest ages, whether Romans or Greeks, French, English, Hindu, Chinese, Indian, or other. The historian stepped forward without formality and took his hero cordially by the hand, spoke to him as friend to friend, or let us say as one man of the world to another. There was never any fear in those days that difference of language or circumstance, as in a different age, might place obstacles in the way of any proper understanding. Men were inspired with faith in a common humanity and by the certainty that if once the human element could be grasped, all the rest would work out of itself. All mankind were agreed as to what God was, what good and evil were, and all were agreed in patriotism and citizenship, in love of parents and of children, in a word, agreed in all realities. If ever this straightforward simplicity that sought its rallying point in things of common human interest were justified in any case, it would be in regard to the Germanic people. We find here a community based upon a general unity, mutual self-sacrifice and self-denial, and the social spirit. A society in which every individual, from birth to death, was bound by consideration for his neighbor. The individuals in this community show in all their doings that they are inspired by one passion, the welfare and honor of their kin, and none of the temptations of the world can move them, even for a moment, to glance aside. They say themselves that this passion is love. What more natural, then, that, than that we, who from our own lives know love and its power, should begin with what we have in common with these people we are considering? Given this agreement on the ancestral point, all that appears strange must surely become simple and comprehensible. Berg Thora, wife of Nial, was a true woman of the old school, strict on the point of honor, inflexible, unforgiving. The key to her character, we might say, is given in the famous words, Young was I given to Nial, and this I have promised him, that one fate shall come upon us both. There is something of common humanity in the words, something we can appreciate at its true value. On the male side, we have even more old-fashioned figure to set up as a model. Egil Skallgrimsen, the most typical representation in Viking times of love and kin. See him as he rides with the body of his drowned son before him on the saddle, carrying it himself to its last resting pace his breast heaving with sobs until his tunic bursts. It is also direct in its appeal, so obvious and natural, that one feels involuntarily as if one could read Eagle's whole soul in this one episode. Life standards and customs of society, morals and self-judgment derived from such elementary emotion can surely not be hard to understand. We can easily put it to the test. In the history of the Faux Islands, we find two women, Thurid and Thora, wife and daughter of Sigmund Brisson, occupying a prominent place. Both are strong, resolute characters, like Burger Thora, and both are guided in all their actions by love of Sigmund and his race. Sigmund was an ideal chieftain of the Christian Viking period, strict on the point of honor, never relinquishing a shred of his right, and always able to gain his cause frank, brave, and skillful. Altogether, a man to admire and remember. After a life of ceaseless fighting for the supreme power in the foes, he is murdered, having barely escaped from a night's surprise. Time passes, and one day, throned of Gata, 
makes his appearance in Thurid's house, asking Thora in marriage for his foster son Leif. Thrawn was a man of a different stamp, one of those who are ready enough to strike, when first they have their victims safely enmeshed by intrigue, one of those who can plot and plan with all the craft of evil, and always find others to bear the danger and disgrace of carrying out their schemes, a Christian by compulsion, and an apostate, not only practicing the rites of the old faith in his daily life, but even dabbling in black magic. Thrawn had been Sigmund's bitterest opponent. It was he who had arranged the killing of Sigmund's father, and the surprise attack which ended in Sigmund's death was led by him. Yet Thor holds out to her suitor the prospect that she will accept his offer. If he and his foster father give her an opportunity of avenging her father, and she keeps her promise, she marries Leif, and has a reward in seeing three men killed in honor of her father. Once more, these two women appear in the history of the Froat nobles. It happens that a son of Sigmund's cousin has been slain while staying in the house of Sigurd Thorkelson, a kinsman of Thrawn. Sigurd had at once struck down the slayer, and those three being the only ones present at the fateful moment, some shadow of suspicion attaches to the host. The mere possibility that one of Sigmund's kinsmen lies slain and unavenged is enough to keep Thurin and Thora in a state of unrest both day and night. Poor Leif, who will not or cannot take any steps in the matter, hears nothing but scornful words about the house. When then Sigurd Throkelson, in his blindness, asks on behalf of his brother for Thorid's hand, her daughter wisely counsels her as follows. If I should advise, this must not be refused, for if you are minded to vengeance, there could be no surer bait. And she adds, no need for me to set words in my mother's mouth. The plan proceeds. Sigurd is invited to have a speech with Thorid. She meets him outside the homestead and leads him to a seat on a tree. He makes as if to sit facing the house, but she sits herself resolutely the other way, with her back to the house, and her face towards the chapel. Sigurd asks if Leif is at home. No, he is not. If Thurid's sons are at home, yes, they are at home. And in a little while, both they and Leif appear, and Sigurd goes off, mortally wounded. These two were Thurid, the great widow, and Thora, whom all held to be the noblest of women. Their greatness lay not so much in the fact of their loving truly and faithfully as in the understanding of what that love demanded, and their fulfilling its demands in spite of all. The question asked of us here is not what we think of these two, but if we are able to accept the appreciative judgment of their love as it stands, without reserve. On a closer scrutiny of Eagle's love and sorrow, we find, too, some characteristic features that are likely to trouble our serene faith in our common humanity. It is related that, having made provision for his son in the hereafter, by setting him in a burial mound that might content him, the old champion himself has minded to die. But his quick-witted daughter, Thurgood, artfully brought back his interest in life by reminding him that nobody else would be able to honor the youth with a laudatory poem, and thus enticing him to make a lay of his loss. And, fortunately for us, this poem in which Eagle laid down the burden of his sorrow has been preserved. There is a depth of meaning in the fact that the most beautiful poem remaining to us from ancient times is a poem of kinship and love of kin, and that it should be Egil himself, the old-fashioned of all the saga heroes who made it. Unfortunately, our understanding and enjoyment of this confession are hampered in very high degree by the difficulties of its form. Egil was not only a man of considerable character, he is also what we should call a poet, whose soul found direct expression in verse or kennings. The kennings or metaphors which were part and parcel of ancient poetry fell from Egil's lips as images revealing the individual moods and passions of the poet. But so strange to our own ears are the poetical figures of the ancient skalds that it needs a great deal of work on our part before we can approach him from such a position that his picture phrases appear with life and significance. Given the patience, however, to acquire familiarity with the artificial metaphors of the skald, 
enough to realize what it is that forces itself through the poet's mind in this cumbersome form. We can feel the sorrow of this bereaved father dropping heavily, solemnly, from verse to verse. He complains that sorrow binds his tongue. Little chance is here to reach forth Odin's stolen goods. Heavy they are to drag from their hiding of sorrow. Thus it is for one who mourns. Eagle applies the parallel of Odin, who with great pains brought the poet's cup, the meat of inspiration from the giant's cave, to himself in his struggle to force a way to express through the walls of his own sorrow. The sea roars down there before the door where my kinsman's hell shape laid. My race bends to its fall as the storm lashed trees of the forested. Cruel has the hole the waves toward my father's kin fence, unfilled, I know, and open stands the sun breach torn in me by sea. Much hath ran, stole from me. I stand poor in love, friends. The sea hath sundered the bonds of my race, torn a close-twisted string out of myself. I say to you, could I pursue my cause with sword? There should be an end to the ale-maker. If I could, I would give battle to those, those wrenches of Agas. But I feel I had no power to take action against my son's bane. All the world sees emptiness behind the old man where he strides along. Much the sea hath stolen from me. Bitter it is to count upon the fall of kinsmen, since he that stood, a shield among the race, turned aside from life on the soul ways. I know it myself. In my son grew no ill promise of man. Ever he maintained that which his father had said, I, though all the people thought other. He held me upright in the home, and mightily increased my strength. My brotherless plight is often in my mind. When the battle grow, I take thought, peer about and think what other man stands by my side with courage for daring deed, such as I need often enough. I am grown cautious of flight now that friends are fewer. These are words that of their great simplicity can be repeated in all times, or at least as long as life is still a struggle, and it would be hard to find higher praise for any such a poem. The following verses consist, as far as we are yet able to understand them, of variations on these fundamental thoughts. No one can be relied on, for men nowadays lower themselves and are glad to accept payment instead of revenge for the blood of brothers. He who has lost his son must begat another. No one else can replace the lost scion. My head is drooping since he, the second of my sons, fell beneath the brand of sickness. He whose fra fame was unsmirched. I trusted in the god, but he was false to his friendship to me, and I have little heart now to worship him. In spite of his bitterness, however, he cannot but remember that he has himself the art of the poet, and a mind able to reveal the plans of enemies, and he cannot forget that this mastery of words, the comfort of many ills, is a gift from the god who has also betrayed him. Darkly he looks towards the future. I am strongly beset. Death stands on the cape, but blithely, unruffled by fear, I wait for hell. The first part of the poem is properly independent of time. The reader has no need to look in any distant age or in a distant culture in order to understand it. It is the form, and that only, which binds it to Egil and skaldic poetry, and the excess of the learned. Even Eggle's passionate outburst against the high powers that have usurped the mastery of the world hardly appeared to us as strange. On the contrary, we might perhaps approve the words as thoroughly human, and even award them honorable mention as being modern in spirit. Our weakness for all that savors of titanic defense, however, must not blind us to the peculiar form of expression in which it is voiced by Eggle. His verses do not express instinctive defiance of fate, but an earnest longing for vengeance and restitution. He is lamenting that he is unable to pursue his cause, or in other words, uphold his right. Is it really to be understood that Egil only relinquishes plans of revenge because he stands alone in the world, without followers or kin? If one lacks in oneself the courage to take arms against a god, 
Can it mend matters greatly to march up with a few staunch friends and kinsmen at one's back? So we may or must ask, and in the asking of this question, our sympathy gives place to a vague poetic feeling that is equivalent to giving up all attempt at understanding. Sorrow can always drive a man to such extremes of his being that his words run into apparent contradictions. But the inconsistency of passion never sets meaning at defiance. It has its explanation in the fact that the opposites have their point of intersection somewhere in the soul. At times the feelings are exalted to such a degree that they appear irreconcilable, but the sympathetic listener feels he has no right of criticism until he has followed the lines to their meeting point. In Egel, the cohesion between the apparent contradictions is no doubt very firm. There is an inner contact between defiance of the gods and the outburst of helplessness at sight of one's solitary plight. But we can ponder and speculate as much as we please. A true understanding of Egel's thoughts here, that he would feel himself master of death if he had a strong circle of kinsmen about him, is not to be won by mere study of these lines. We cannot get at it unless Egel himself and the man of his time give us a real solution. Egel appears to regard life in the light of a process at law, where the man with a strong circle of kinsmen wins his case, because he is backed by a crowd of men ready to swear upon his side and whose oaths carry weight enough to crush his opponent. Let us imagine that this idea of his is not merely a piece of poetic imagery, but that life itself, with all of its tasks, appeared as a lawsuit, where a man with many and powerful kinsmen could further his aims and fortunes, materially and spiritually gaining power over his surroundings, not only but battle, but by oath, in virtue of that power of race which he and his possessed. Let us further imagine that his faith in the power of kinship and kinsmen help is great enough to reach out beyond life, and embrace death itself within its scope, believing itself capable of summoning and outswearing the gods, I shaking heaven and earth. Egel's words have then a new significance. They lose nothing of their weight, but they become anything but modern. The titanic defiance disappears, or almost disappears and in its place we have the despairing cry of a suffering human soul. The paradox, then, lies not where we had first discerned it, but in quite another direction. And reading now from these words, backward and forward, the other verses, that at first flowed so glibly from our tongue, will have gained a strange power and violence, both where he speaks of a string torn out of him, a breach, and also where he calls to mind his son's help, and reveals his own discouragement, when he looks about him in the fight for one to aid him. It would be strange if we did not feel, in place of the confident enjoyment of the words, a sense of uncertainty that makes us hesitate at every line. The words have become vague, because we have lost our own ground, and failed to get a new foothold, torn out. Our fancy flutters doubtfully away from the metaphorical meaning, which at first appeared the only one the words could have, and hovers about the idea of an actual bleeding to death, but without finding anything to hold by. And our uncertainty cannot but increase when we discover that Eggle's image of the family as a fence, built up of stake by stake, of death as a breach in the family and those left, that these images are common, everyday illustrations, one is tempted to say. Part of the technical stock and trade. We cannot give ourselves up to the mighty feeling of the poem until we have grasped exactly what it is to this breach, this wound consists of. What precise meaning lies in the word help? We begin to perceive that we must learn the meaning of every word anew. Here our trust in primeval common feeling as a means of communication between men of different cultures breaks down for good. We cannot force our way into understanding through mere sympathy or intuition, where is no other way but to turn round and proceed from externals inward to the generally human. Briefly, we must begin with the kin, the race or family, a gathering of individuals so joined up into one unit that they appear incapable of independent action as to the feeling which so unites them. This we must leave till later. The point here is that the individual 
cannot act without all acting with and through him. No single individual can suffer without affecting the whole circle. So absolute is the connection that the individual simply cannot exist by himself. A slight loosening of the bond, and he slips down, the most helpless of all creatures. We cannot gain speech of the individual human being. Here lies the difference between Hellenic and Germanic culture. The Hellene is near to us, for we can go straight to him, speak to him as man to man about the life of man, let him introduce us into the strange world, as it seems to us in which he lives. Let him show us the aims that determine his daily thought and actions, and from his utterance and expression, form an idea as to how he reacts in face of what he meets. The barbarian does not move. He stands stiffly, uninvitingly. If he speaks, his word conveys no meaning to us. He has killed a man. Why did you kill that man, we ask? I kill him in revenge. How had he offended you? His father had spoken ill words to my father's brother. Therefore, I craved honor as due from him to us. Why did you not take the life of the offender himself? Oh, because this was a better man. The more we ask and pry, the more incomprehensible he becomes. He appears to us a machine driven only by principles. The Hellene exists as an individual, a separate person within a community. The Germanic individual exists only as a representative, nay, has the personification of a whole. One might imagine that a supreme convulsion of the soul must tear the individual out from that whole, and let him feel himself, speak as for himself. But actually it is the opposite that takes place. The more the soul is moved, the more the individual personality is lost amongst the kin. At the very moment when man most passionately and unreservedly gives way to his own feelings, the clan takes possession of the individual fully and completely. Egil's lament is not the lament of a father for his son. It is the kin that utters its lament through the person of the father. From this breath of passion springs the overpowering pathos of the poem. If we want a real understanding of such men as Egil, we are driven to ask, what is the hidden force that makes kinsmen inseparable? First we learn that they call each other friend. Frandi in Icelandic, or Frund in Anglo-Saxon. And a linguistic analysis of this word will teach us that it means those who love. But this brings us no farther, for etymology tells us nothing of what it is to love. We can perhaps get a little nearer by noting the etymological connection between the word friend and two others that play a great part in the social life of these days. Free and Frith. In Frith, peace. We have the old kinsman's own definition of a fundamental idea in their interrelationships. By frith they mean something in themselves, a power that makes them friends, one towards another, and free men towards the rest of the world. Even here, of course, we cannot take the meaning of the word directly for granted, for the centuries have not passed unscathing over that little word. Words such as horse and cart and house and kettle may remain more or less unaltered throughout all vicissitudes of culture. But terms used to designate spiritual values necessarily undergo radical change in the course of such spiritual transformations as have taken place in the souls of men in the North during the past thousand years. And the nearer such a world lies in its origin to the central port of the soul, the more sweeping changes it will undergo. If ever word bore the mark of the transforming influence of Christianity and humanism, it is the word frith. For we look closely into the older significance of the word, we shall find something sterner, a firmness that has now given place to weakness. The frith of earlier days was less passive than now, with less submissiveness and more will. It held also an element of passion which has now been submerged in quietism. But the word tells us undisputably that the love which knit these kinsmen together is not to be taken in a modern sentimental sense. The dominant note of kinsmanship is safety and security. 
Frith is the state of things which exists between friends, and it means, fast and foremost, reciprocal involability. However individual wills may clash in a conflict of kin against kin, however stubbornly individual heads may seek their own way according to their quota of wisdom. There can never be question of conflict, save in the sense of thoughts and feelings, working their way toward an equipoise in unity. We need have no doubt but that good kinsmen could disagree with fever, but, how, but however the matter might stand, there could, should, must inevitably be but one ending to it all, a settlement peaceably and making for peace. Frith. A quarrel had no lethal point. Two kinsmen could not lift a hand one against the other. The moment a man scented kinship, he lowered his arms. The ending of Bjorn the Hitdale warrior saga was a touch of something heroic comic about it. From this very fact, Bjorn fell, after a brave fight, by the hand of Fjord Kibinson and his companions. The grounds of enmity between the two were numerous and various, but we may safely say that Bjorn had done all in his power to interfere with Thord's domestic bliss. Among the opponents, Thord's young son, Koli, takes a prominent part. Then, says Bjorn, at the moment when he is beaten to his knee and at bay, You strike hard today, Koli. I do not know whom I shall spare here, answers the youth. True enough, for your mother has surely urged you not to spare me. But it seems to me that you are not wisest in the matter of knowing your kin. And Coley answers, It is late in the day, you tell me of it, if we two are not free to fight. And with this these words, he withdraws from all further participation in the battle. Even in the Icelandic sagas from the period of dissolution, we find very few instances of men entering into combinations which might lead to family conflicts. The by no means lovable Feo chieftain Thayend of Gata is offered money to take sides against his cousins. But before accepting, he pays tribute to the sense of what is right by saying to the tempter, You cannot mean this in earnest. On another occasion, when we read that a certain man must have been sorely blind to take part in a fight where his own sons were on the other side, there rings through the words a mixture of wonder and repugnance which speak louder than the sharpest of condemnations. For this wonder springs from the thought, how can he do such a thing? It is hard to get at a true impression of the fundamental laws in human life that provide the very essence of a conscience. Harder still to render such an impression living to others. They are not to be illustrated by noteworthy examples, in books of great and good deeds. A quality such as Frith will never be represented in proportion to its importance. It goes too deep. It does not find direct expression in the laws. It underlines all accepted customs, but never appears in the light itself. If we would seriously realize what is strongest in men, we must feel through their daily life with all its inhibitions and restraints, in little things. But once our eyes opened, the unbroken chain of self-restraint and self-control that constitute the inner connection and the life of working human beings, we may find ourselves almost in fear of the power that sits innermost in ourselves, and drives us according to its will. When one has worked through the spiritual remains of our forefathers, one must, I think, infallibly emerge with a constraining veneration for this frith. The Northmen are ever telling of war and of strife, quarrels and bickerings, disputes now over a kingdom, now an ox, now some piece of arrogance on the part of an individual, now a merciless combination of accidents by the hand of fate, leading men into chaos of strife. But we notice that even in the most violent turmoil of passion, all alike are ever amenable to one consideration. Every single happening stands in some relation to Frith. And behind every law decree, there is a perceptible a fear, a sacred dread, of interfering with one particular thing, to wit, the ties of kinship. We fear that all law paragraphs are based upon an underlining presumption that kinsmen will not and cannot act one against another, but must support one another. When the church began to exercise its supervision in matters of legislation, it noticed first of all an essential failing in the ancient code, 
namely that it knew no provisions for cases of killing between kinsmen. The crime, therefore, came within clerical jurisdiction. The church determined its penal code, just as it provided terms for the crime, by adaption of words from the Latin vocabulary. When the lawgivers of the Middle Ages gradually found courage to come to grips with this ancient frith, in order to make room for modern principles of law, the attacks had first to be made in the form of indulgences. It was permitted to regard a kinsman's suit as irrelevant to oneself, and it was declared lawful to refuse a contribution towards the fine imposed on one of any one's kin. It took centuries of work to eradicate the tacit understanding of this obituous frith principle from law, and establish humanity openly as the foundation of equity. Strangely enough, in the very period of transition, when Frith was being ousted from its supremacy as consciousness itself, it finds definite expression and laws, to wit, in the statues of the medieval guilds. A continuation, not precisely of the clan, but of what was identical with clanmanship, to wit, the old free societies of Frith, or communities of mutual support. The guild laws provided that members of the guild must have no quarrel between themselves, but in the regrettable event of such a quarrel arising between two of the same guild, the parties are forbidden, under pain of exclusion and disgrace, to summon each other before any tribunal but that of the guild itself. Not even in a foreign country may any member of a guild bring suit against a fellow member before a magistrate of court. The Frisian peasant laws of the Middle Ages also found it necessary to lay down hard and fast rules for the obligations of kin toward kin, and decree that persons within the closer degrees of relationship as father, son, brother, father's or mother's brother, father's or mother's sister, may not bring suit one against another before the court. They must not sue or swear against one another, but in cases where they cannot agree in a matter of property or the like, one of the nearest kin will be appointed judge. The guild statutes are as near to the unwritten law of kinship as any lifeless, extraneous provision can be to the consciousness that has life in and of itself. And they give us indeed the absolute character of Frith, its freedom from all reservation, in brief. But they cannot give the soul of it. For then, instead of insisting that no quarrel shall be suffered to arise between one brother and another, they would simply acknowledge that no such quarrel could by any possibility ever arise. In other words, instead of a prohibition, one should have the recognition that it was an impossibility. The characters in the Icelandic sagas are in this position still, though we may feel that the cohesion of the clan is on the point of weakening. They have still, more or less, unimpaired the involuntary respect for all such interests as may affect the clan as a whole. An extreme of caution and foresight in regards to all such enterprise as cannot, with certainty, be regarded as unaffecting the interests of all its members. Even the most reckless characters are chary of making promises or alliances if they see any possibility of prejudicing a kinsman's interest. They go in dread of such conflicts. The power of Frith is apparent, and the fact that it does not count as a virtue, something in excess of what is demanded, but as an everyday necessity, a most obvious thing, alike for high and low, heroic and unheroic characters, and the exceptions, therefore, show us as something abhorrent and something uncanny. Clanship was not the only form of relationship between individuals, and however wisely and cautiously a man might order his goings, he could never be sure of avoiding every painful dilemma. He may find himself in a position where, apparently, the power of Frith in himself is put to the test. Thus, for instance, with Gudran, her husband Sigurd has been slain by her own brothers, Gunnar and Hogni. She voices her resentment in stirring words. In the lay of Guldrun we find it thus, In bed and at board, I lack my friend to speak with. This rots Gurki's sons. Gurki's sons have brought me to this misery, brought about their sister's bitter weeping. The poems of the North also make her utter words of ill omen. It sounds like a curse when she says, your heart, Hogni, should be torn by ravens in wild places, where you should cry in vain for aid of man. 
but there is no place in the saga for even the least act of Guldrun's part to the prejudice of her brothers. She seeks by act and word to hinder Atli's plans for vengeance against Gulnar and Hogni, and when all her warnings are in vain, she makes Atli pay dearly for the deed. The northern poets, while laying stress on her sorrow, keep it thoroughly inactive. They do not even attempt to soften the contrast by any kind of inner conflict in her soul. There is no hesitation, no weighing this way or that. Frith was to them the one thing always absolute. The poet lets Hogni answer, Guldun's passionate outburst with those deeply significant words, If the ravens tore my heart, your sorrow would be the deeper. The Sigurd poems are fashioned by northern hands, dealing with ancient themes. They give us Germanic thoughts, as lived again in Norse or Icelandic minds. Altogether Icelandic, broad in theme and word, is the tragedy which leads to Gisli Sursen's unhappy outlawry. The two brothers, Gisli and Thorkel, are depicted by the writer of the saga as widely different in character, and in their sympathies they take different sides. Thorkel is a close friend of Throgrim, their sister's husband. Gisli is warmly attached to Vistin, brother to his own wife, Old. Relationships between the two half-brothers-in-law have evidently long been strained, and at last Vistin is slain by Throgrim. Gisli takes vengeance secretly by entering Throgrim's house at night and stabbing him as he lies in bed. Throgrim's avengers, led by a natural suspicion, pay a visit to Gisli before he is up. Thorkel, who lives with his brother-in-law and is of the party, manages to enter first, and seeing Gisli's shoes full of snow on the floor, he thrusts them hurriedly under the bed. The party is obliged to go off again without having accomplished anything. Lately, however, Gisli, in reckless verse, declares himself the, prop, the culprit, and a party rides off to summon him to account. Thorkel is with him as before, but once more he manages to warn his brother. On the road, the party comes to a homestead, where he suddenly remembers there is money owing to him, and takes the opportunity of dunning his debtor. But while his horse stands saddled outside the, the house, and his companions imagine him counting money within, he is riding on a borrowed mount up into the words, woods where his brother has hidden. And when at last he has settled his various money fares and taken the road again, he is overtaken by little accidents on the way, sufficient to delay the progress of the party considerably. Gisli's blow was a serious matter, Thorkel. He says himself to Gisli, You have done me no little wrong, I should say, in slaying Throgrim, my brother-in-law, and partner, and close friend. The great obligations which use and custom laid upon friends one toward another are evident of the seriousness with which such intimacy was regarded, and how deeply the parties engaged themselves and with their will in the relationship. Thorkel's position is therefore more bitter than immediately appears, but friendship must give way to Frith. It is not as a matter of choice in Thorkel's part. Here again we have the same contrast as the Gudrun's poems. Thorkel's bitterness and his firth can have no dealings the one with the other. They cannot come within reach of each other so as to give rise to any conflict, for they belong to a different strata of the soul. To us, perhaps, it may seem as if there was a link missing from the sober statement of the story, but the words as they stand are good Icelandic psychology. The frith is something that underlies all else, deeper than all inclination. It is not a matter of will, in the sense that those who share it again and again choose to set their kinship before all other feelings. It is rather the will itself. It is identical to the actual feeling of kinship, and not a thing derived from kinship. Thorkel has his sorrow, has Gudrun has hers. But the possibility which should make that that sorrow double-edged, the mere thought that one could take sides here, is out of the question. Thus there could never be room for a problem. The fact of a kin siding against his kin is known to poetry only as a mystery, or as a horror, as the outcome of a madness, or as something dark, something incomprehensible, something that's not even fate. From early times, men's thoughts have hovered about this fact that a man could come to slay his kinsman. In the picture of father and son, each unknown to the other, meeting in battle and shedding each other's blood, 
the sad possibility has ever been treated poetically. A magnificent fragment, fortunately but a torso, of these poems is found in the German Hildebandle, where the father, returning home after a long absence in foreign lands, meets his son, who forces him, against his will, to engage in single combat. We find the pair in Saxo, as two brothers, Helfdin and Hilge, in the Hildebrand Lay. It is the skepticism of the son in regard to the father's declaration of kinsmanship that brings about the disaster. The father must accept the challenge, or stand dishonored. In Saxo, the inner force of this conflict is weakened by the fact that Hildege, for no reason, keeps his knowledge of their kinsmanship to himself until he lies mortally wounded. Saxo's story, however, is evidently derived from the same situation as that preserved in the German lay. Hildegard tries by craft to escape from fate, declaring in lordly fashion that he cannot think of engaging in single combat with an unproved warrior. But when Halfdane, undismayed, repeats his challenge and strikes down one set of antagonists after the other, Hildegard, who sees his own fame thus threatened by Halfdane's prowess, cannot endure any longer to refuse. An Icelandic version, preserved in the saga of Osmond Kopobane, agrees throughout, so closely with Saxo's account that we are forced to presume a close relationship between the two. One of the brothers here has still the old name, Hildebrand. The other has been assimilated with Asmund, the hero of the saga. The difference between the more natural presentation of the Hildebrand lay and the dramatic artifice in the northern variants is mainly due to the saga's writer's anxiety to preserve as much effect as possible for their final plaint. The story of the fatal meeting between two kinsmen is, as an epic theme, not specifically Germanic. We can follow it to the west, among the Celts, and to the southward, as far even as Asia. Possibly, we might say probably, it has its origin as a matter of literary history in the south. But it is more important to note how the theme is reborn again and again among one clannish people after another. A proof that the same thoughts were everywhere, a weight upon the mind. Men pondered and speculated over this mystery in the ordering of life, that a man could be driven against his will to harm his own kin. In the Germanic, the case is clearly and simply stated. Frith was invaluable. But honor, too, had its own absolute validity, so that the two could collide with such force as to destroy both upon the impact, and the man with them. The close of the Hildebrand lay is unfortunately lost the very part which must have given us the united plant of the two combatants over what had passed. The loss is the more serious, since this was the dominant point of the whole poem. Saxo's reproduction, and still more the modernized eulogy of the Icelandic saga, give but a faint echo. But even in these latter imitation works, we seem to find a pathos of an altogether different nature from the usual. Not the merciless seriousness of death, but a wandering rising to horror. Not a confident appeal to fate with a sense of comfort and the conviction that there is a reparation for everything, and that reparations will be made for this as well, if those that remain are of any worth, but only helplessness and hopelessness. And the same note is struck elsewhere, as in the saga, where Angantir, finding his brother's body on the field of battle, says, A curse is upon us, and I should be your bane, this thing will be ever ill-remembered. Ill is the doom of the Norns. The words express his sense of being a monster. So desperately meaningless is his fate that it will force the thoughts of posterity to hover about it, that he will be a song for coming generations. The close of Hildebrand's complaint runs, in Sacto's paraphrase, approximately as follows. An evil fate, loading years of misfortune on the happy, Buries smile and sorrow and bruises fate. For it a pitiful misery to drag on life and suffering, To breathe under the pressure of sorrow-burdened days, And go in fear in the omen. But all that is knit fast by the prophetic decree of the paquet, All that is planned in the council of high providence, All that was once by forevision been fixed in the chain of fate, Is not to be torn from its place by any changing of worldly things. There is nothing corresponding to these lines in the saga, 
The first part of the poem expresses the same as Saxo's paraphrase. None knows beforehand what matter of death shall be his. You were born of draught in Denmark, I in Sweden. My shield lies sundered at my head. There is the tale of my killings. There, presumably upon the shield, lies the son I begat, an unwilling slew, that his refers to we do not rightly know. And then the poem closes with a prayer to the survivor to do what few slayers have any mind to, namely wrap the dead man in his own garments, a termination which sounds altogether foreign in its romantic sentimentality to the northern spirit. Saxo is here undoubtedly worked from another version, nearer the original. His portrayal of the evil days lived through it in fear fits more or less accurately in the old thought. Such a deed buries all hope for the future, and spreads among the survivors an everlasting dread. How the words originally stood in the northern version, it's futile to guess. But Saxo's omen, in particular, seems to hold a true northern idea, that such a deed forms an ill-boding warning. For the rest, fate rules. What is to come will come. But here's a thing breaking out beyond fate. One can, and could really say, that the fate of the kinsman was burst asunder. The same hopeless keynote rings through the description, in the Beowulf, of the old father's sorrow when one of his sons was by chance slain his brother. The poet compares him to an old man who sees his beloved son dangling, still young, in the gallows, a desperate illustration for a per Germanic poet to use. Then he lifts up his voice in a song of anguish, and his son hangs at the raven's pleasure, and he cannot help him, old and burdened with days, cannot save him. Always he remembers, morning after morning, his son's passing, and ere in his stead he cares not to wait in the castle. Sorrowing he sees his wine-hall waste, the chamber wind-swept, empty of joy in his son's house. The gallow rider sleeps, the hero in his grave, no sound of harp, no pleasure now in the homestead, was there was once. He takes his eyes away to the couch, sings a sad chant, Lonely over the lonely one. Everywhere in the fields, as in the home, there is too wide a space, so ragged sorrow in the prince of the Verdes. Slowly for his son, Hirbal, in no wise could he gain payment for that killing through the life of the slayer, nor by rewarding the young hero with bitter doings towards him. Though he had no love for him, misery held him fast. From the day that the wound was dealt him, until he passed out, from the joyous world of men. But Frith demands more than that kinsmen should merely spare each other. Thorkel Sursen was a weak character. He was content to place himself in an equ equivocal position when he kept his place among his brother-in-law's Avengers. He says to Gisli, I will warn you if I come by news of any plans against you, but I will not render you any such help as might bring me into difficulties. Gisli evidently regards this caution as a dishonest compromise with his conscience. Such an answer as you have given me here I could never give to you, and I could never act in such a way, he retorts. A man will not ride in company with his kinsman's adversaries. A man will not lie idle while his kinsman's suit is in progress, and the fact that this same kinsman has nailed his brother-in-law fast to his bed by night is plainly of no weight in Gisli's judgment. A man does not sneak around by a back way to offer his kinsman a trifle of help. No, when the latter is finally outlawed, he must at least be able to count on support. This seems, in all seriousness, to be Gisli's idea. And Gisli is in the right. Frith is something active. It's not merely leading kinsmen to spare each other, but forcing them to support one another's cause. Help and stand sponsors for one another. Trust one another. Our words are too dependent for their strength on sentimental association to bear out the full import of clan feeling. The responsibility is absolute, because kinsmen are literally the doers of one another's deeds. The guild statutes provide as follows. Should it so happen that any brother kills any man who is not a brother of the guild of St. Canut, then the brethren shall help him in his peril of life as best they can. If he be by the water, they shall help him with boat, or dipper, tinderbox, and axe. Should he need a horse, they are to provide him with horse. Any brother able to help, and not helping, he shall go out of this guild as a nidling. 
every brother shall help his brother in all lawsuits. That is to say, if one, another, one brother has a lawsuit, twelve brethren of the guild shall be chosen to go with him to his hearing and support him. The brethren are also to form an armed guard about him, and escort him to and from the place where the court is held, if need be. And when a brother has to bring oath before the court, twelve members of the guild shall be chosen by lot to swear on his side. And those so chosen are to aid him in minly wise. A man failing to support his brother by oath, or bearing testimony against him, is subjected to heavy fines. There are two kinds of cases, or two kinds of killing. I.g. 1. A guild brother kills a stranger, and 2. A stranger kills a guild brother. In the former case, the brethren of the guild see that the slayer gets away in safety on horseback or by ship. In the latter case, the rule runs as forward. No brother eats or drinks or has intercourse with his brother's slayer, whether on land or on ship. The guild brethren shall aid the dead man's heirs to vengeance or restitution. It is difficult, perhaps, to realize that this double valuation had its place in a community of citizens, and not in some freebooter camp. It stands valid as the supreme law for decent, conservative, enlightened men, men who in those days represented, so to speak, progress in historic continuity. This partisan celerity and frith is their strong attachment to the past, and the cultural worth of this partisan spirit is revealed by the th fact that it lies behind the reform movements of the Middle Ages as their driving force. As the brethren here in the guilds, so kinsmen also were filled to such degree with love, so eager to help that they could not well find any energy left for judging of right and wrong. They were not by nature and principle unjust, partisan. Faith and the sense of justice can well thrive together. But they belong. To use a phrase already used before, to different strata of the soul, and thus miscontact with each other. An uncompromising character of Frith is strikingly illustrated by the last appearance of Grand Old Eagle at the Moot Place. It happened one day when Eagle was grown old and somewhat set aside that a quarrel arose between his son Thorstein and Anad Sjöden's son Steiner without a piece of land about a piece of land. Steiner defiantly sent his herd to graze there, and Thorstein faithfully cut down his herdsmen. Steiner summoned Thorstein, and now the parties were at the law thing. Then the assembly perceived a party riding up, led by a man in full armor. It is old Egil, and a following of eighty men. He dismounts calmly by the booths, makes the needed full arrangements, then goes up to the mound where the court is held, and calls to his old friend Ulund. Is it your doing that my son is summoned for breaking the peace? No, indeed, says Ulund. It is not by my will. I am more careful of our ancient friendship than to do so. It was well you came. Well, let us see now if you mean anything by what you say. Let us too rather take the matter in hand, than those two fighting cocks should suffer themselves to be egged on against each other by their own youth and the counsels of others. And when then the matter is submitted to Egil's aberration, he calmly decides that Sterner shall receive no enmity for the slaves killed. His homestead is confiscated, and he himself shall leave the district before fitting a day. There is a touch of nobility about Egil's last public appearance the nobility of a greatly simple character. He accepts the office of arbitrator and decides the case, as we can see, against all reasonable, likely justified expectation, as if only his own side existed, and does so with a cool superiority, which leaves no sort of doubt that he acts with the full approval of his conscience, where again Eagle stands as a monument, expression of a dying age. The same naivete is seen directly in another old-fashioned character, Halfred, called the wayward scald. On one occasion, when his father, with rare impartiality, was judged against him, he says, Whom can I trust when my father fails me? The straightforward simplicity, taking one view as a matter of course, places Halfred, as it does Eagle, outside all comparison with great or small examples of selfishness or injustice, and makes them types more than types of their age. They are types of a form of culture itself. So thought, so acted, not the expectations, the marked individualities, not the men who were somewhat apart from the common, but men generally. The idea of Frith 
is set so deeply beneath of all personal marks of character and all individual inclination that it affects them only from below, not as one inclination or one feeling may affect another. The characters may be widely different, but the breach in character does not reach down to his prime center of the soul. Eagle was a stiff, naked man, hard to deal with at home and abroad. He would be master in his house, and a treaty of peace in which he did not himself dictate the terms he would not be disposed to recognize. Another man might be more easygoing, peaceable, ready to find a settlement, quick to avoid collision, and eager to remove cause of conflict, but he could never be so save on the basis of frith and kinship. Haskell, the right-minded, peacemaking chieftain of the Reichdale, is perhaps rather too modern a character to go well in company with Eagle, but his story, as we find it in the saga of the Reichdale men, gives us at any rate a graphic picture of the principles of reconciliation. Askel is so unfortunate as to have a sister's son whose character is such that strife seems a necessity to him, and Askel's task in life is to follow on the heels of his this vermin and put matters right again after him. He carries out his task faithfully, is ever on the spot as soon as Vermin has had one of his great days to effect a reconciliation and make good the damage done by his kinsmen. Vermin's achievements in the greater style began with the joining company with a wealthy but bad man, Hanif of Ulfgenwenstagen, whom he knits close to himself by accepting an offer of fostering a child. Hanif naturally makes use of these good connections to carry out his rascally tricks to a greater extent than before. He steals cattle, in spite of earnest representations from Askel. Vermin takes up his friend's case, and even craftily exploits his uncle's respected name to gather men on his side. The result is a battle in which Hanif and two good men fall on the one side, and on the other a free man and a slave. Askel comes up and makes peace between the parties, judging Hanif and the slave as equal. Likewise, man for man, of the others slain, leaving the opponents to pay a fine for the remaining one. Thus judges the most impartial man in Iceland, when it is a question of making good what his kinsman has done ill. Vermont's next achievement of note is cheating a Norwegian skipper to sell him a shipload of wood already sold to Stengrim of Ford. Sterngham retaliates by having Vermund's slaves killed, and his part of the wood brought home to himself. Askel has to go out again and settle matters, and when Vermund finds that his intervention has not produced him reparation for the slaves, Askel offers him full payment for them out of his own purse. This Vermund refuses to accept, tactfully reserving to himself the right to settle accounts in his own fashion when opportunity offers. He tries in vain to make things balancing by stealing a couple of oxen Sterngrim has brought. His disinterestedness in the affair is shown by his offering them to Askelis' gift, but he gets no real result out of this either, only a couple of killings and a settlement, the last, of course, being Askel's verb. The only objection Vermin has to the settlement is that Askel has once more left the killing of the slaves in the earlier affair out of consideration. He now tries another way, hiring a wretch to insult Sturgeon in a peculiarly obnoxious fashion, and this time Askel's attempt at peacemaking fails, owing to the bitter resentment of the other party. Not until an attempted vegemin has led to the killing of Vermin's brother, Herloth does the right-minded chieftain succeed in effecting a settlement, whereby Herloff is to be paid for. Two of Sturgeon's companions are to be exiled forever, and two others for two years. Thus the game goes on, with acts of aggression on Vermin's part, always as mischievous as ever, and intervention on the part of Askel, always in full agreement with the principles of Frith, until at last the measure is full, and when Stringham with his following place themselves in the way of Askel and Vermin and their men, Askel accepts the combat without enthusiasm, but also without demur, and that was the end of Askel and Stringham. Smartness and diplomacy were not forbidden qualities, according to the old usage. Any man was free to edge and elbow his way through the world, even in matters directly concerning his relationship to brothers and kin. He could take little liberties with the Firth as long as he was careful not to effect any actual breach, however slight. 
but he must always be prepared to find it rising inflexibly before him. It is quite permissible to let one's kinmen know that one personally preferred another way of life than that they had chosen to follow, and that one would be happier to see them to adopt one's own principles. This, at least, could be done in Iceland at the period of the sagas, but I do not think this freedom was then of recent date. But Firth stood firm, as ever, as for disowning the action of one's kinsmen and taking up a personal, neutral standpoint, such a thing was always out of the question. A man is brought home, lifeless. The question of what he has done and his antecedents generally fades away into the dimmest background. Here is the fact. He is our kinsman. The investigation has for its object, slain by the hand of man or not, wounds, what sort, who was the slayer, and thereupon the kinsmen choose their leader, or gather round the born avenger, and promise him all assistance in prosecuting the case, whether by force of arms or of law. The kinsmen of the slayer, on their part, is well aware of what is not to be done. They know that vengeance is on their heels. So simple and straightforward is the idea of Frith that reckons that facts alone take no count of personal consideration, and causes which led to this violent conclusion. Throughout the whole of the old Nordic literature, with its countless killings, justified or not, there is not a single instance of men willingly refraining from attempts at vengeance on account of the character of their kinsman deceased. They may be forced to let him lie as he lies, they may realize the hopelessness of any endeavor to obtain reparation, but in every case we can apply the utterance occasionally found, I would spare nothing could I be sure that vengeance was to be gained. It is certainly saying a great deal to assert that there is not a single instance, there might be, and probably were, cases of homicide, the further course of which we do not know. The positive testimony lies in fact that the saga writer rarely fails to emphasize the bitterness of despair which fell to the lot of men forced to relinquish their revenge, and the bitterness of this enforced self-denial is also apparent in the prohibitions which are occasionally to be issued in the southern as well as in the northern parts of Teutonic territory, against taking vengeance for any offender lawfully judged and lawfully hanged. On the other hand, the slayer comes home and states simply and briefly that so-and-so has been killed, and his kinsman will hardly judge me free of all blame in this matter. The immediate effect of these words is that his kinsmen prepare for defense, to safeguard themselves and their man. It, in the course of this preparations, they let fail a word or so inert the undesirability of acting, as he was just done. It is merely an aside, an utterance apart from the action, and without any tendency to affect it. It serves only to enhance the effect of determination. An Icelander greets his kinsman in the doorway with the earnest wish that he would either turn over a new leaf and live decently, or else find some other place to stay. Which said, the two go indoors and discuss what measures are now to be taken in regard to the visitor's lightest killing. Or the offender may answer, as Throvith Kalk, who is guilty of simple murder, answers the reproach of his kinsman, Thoran. It is little use to bewail what is now done. You will only bring further trouble on yourself if you refuse to help us. If you take up the matter, it will not be hard to find others who will aid. And Thorn replies, It is my counsel that you move hither with all of yours, and that we gather others to us. A crude but not altogether unique instance of the compelling power of Firth is found in the story of Hulif of the Vultisdel. This ne'er-do-well ships to Iceland with his witch of a mother, makes his appearance at the farm of his uncle Simon, and claims to be received there in accordance with the bond of kinship between them. Simon shrewdly observes that he seems regrettably nearer in character to his mother than to his father's stock, but Hulif brushes the reproach away with a simple answer, I cannot live on ill foretellings. When life with Hulif in the homestead becomes unendurable, and Saman's son Gaiman complains of him as intolerable, Hulif open, opines that it is shameful thus to rail over trifles, and discredit one's kin. He is given a holding, kills a man for which killing Saman has to pay the fine, and when at last he is crowned his record by killing Ingrimund, Saman's foster brother, who on the strength of this friendship had given Hulif land of his own, he rides straight to Germond and forces the latter to protect him. By the words, here I will suffer myself to be slain, to your disgrace. We find it hardly remarkable that Samond, when a neighbor calls with well-founded complaints against his nephew, doings in the district should give vent to a sigh. 
it were but good if such men were put out of the world. But what does the neighbor say? You would very surely think otherwise of any attempt in earnest. There lies the great difficulty. Samen is obliged to hold by Hülfe as far as ever possible, not merely to cover him, but further, to maintain his cause in face of his opponents. Here is a scene from Violet's saga, where Liotti's words are particularly characteristic. There have been a killing. The other matters between Liotti and his kinsmen are on the one hand, and the two sons of Sigmund, Hulf and Hali, on the other. All dissension has now been buried by fair reconciliation, thanks to the right-manned intervention of Gudmund the Mighty. Bodva, a third son of Sigmund, has been abroad during these things, and now returns. He had is forced to seek shelter during a storm in the house of Thorgrim. Liotti's brother, against Thorgrim's will, and in spite of his endeavors, to prevent any of the household from leaving the place while the guests are there. One man, Sigmund, sleeps away and hurries off to make trouble. Liot will not kill an inoffending man and break the peace agreed on, nor will he raise a hand against his brother's guests. But there are others who still bear a grudge, and Bodvo is killed as he goes on his way from Throgren's house. What can the eager Avengers do now but come to Liot, the best man of the family? It may cost a few hard words, but we shall be safe with him, one of them suggests. It was he who counseled against vengeance, another points out, but he meets with the retort, the more we are in need of him, the more stoutly will he help. They then inform Liot that they have taken vengeance for their kinsmen, and the saga goes on. Liot, it is ill to have evil kinsmen who only lead one into trouble. What is done? What is now to be done? They set out to find Throgrim, and of course, the saga has no need to state that Liot is one of the party. Liot says, Why did you house our unfriends, Throgrim? He answers, What else could I do? I did my best, though it did not avail. Sigmund did his best, and when all is said and done, it fell out otherwise than I had wished. Liot, better had it been if your plans had been followed, but now it is best we do not stay apart. It can hardly be otherwise now than what I should help, and I will take the lead. I have little wish for great undertakings, but I will not lose what is mine for any man. Throgrim asks what is to become of Yul, who of his own will had taken an eager part in the act of vengeance. Lot will undertake to protect him, and grade him away out of the country. But Bjorn, says Liot, is to stay with me, and his fate shall be mine. Bjorn was Liot's sister's son, and had been the leader of the party who killed Bodva. There is a sounding echo of the active character of this firth in the old German's paraphrasing of the Sermon on the Mount, in Germanizing Christ's command as to unreserved self-denial. If thine eye offend thee, thy hand send thee, cast them from thee, he says. Go not with the kinsman who leads to sin to wrong, though he be never so closely thy kinsman. Better to cast him aside to abhor him and lay waste love in the heart, that one may arise alone to the high heaven. Personal sympathies and antipathies gone can, of course, never stand up against the authority of Firth. Relations between Thorsten and his father had never been very cordial. To Egil's mind, his son was his, ever too soft, too easy-going a man. Egil could not thrive in his house, but went in his old age to live with a stepdaughter. But his personal feelings towards his son could not make him stop a single moment to consider whether or not he should interfere. The Bandamana saga has a little story based on this theme, of a father and son who never could get along together, but are drawn together by their common feelings against all outsiders. The son is Odd, a wealthy man, whose vif is father's poor. Odd gets entangled in a lawsuit, which his ill-wishers take advantage of to squeeze him thoroughly. They have sworn together not to let him go free till they have stripped him. Then artful old Usif comes along, and under cover of his notorious ill-will towards his son, goes about among the conspirators, opening the eyes of a few of them to the hazardous nature of their undertaking. As purely as my son has money in his chest, so surely also has he wit in his head to find a way when what is needed. Do you properly know how much of the booty there will fall to each, when there are eight of you to share? For you need not think my son will sit waiting at home for you. He has a ship, as you know, 
and save for homestead and land, a man's wealth will float on water. That much I know. Nay, but what a man has gotten, that he has. And where the old man is nearing, letting fall a fat purse in beneath his cloak, the price he had demanded of his son beforehand for his help. Thus he went unhesitatingly about the work of Firth, as he understood it, and took a hearty pride in his and his son's success in settling the matter. All must give way to Firth. All obligations, all considerations of self, everything, down to the regard for one's own personal dignity, if such a thing could be imagined as existing apart from the feeling of kinship. The great heroic example of daughterly and sisterly fidelity is Signy. The Vosagonia tells, presumably, based throughout in older poems, how a disagreement between Vrusing and his son-in-law, Sigir, Signy's husband, leads to the slaying of the former. Volsung's only surviving son, Sigmund, has to take to the woods, and there he ponders on revenge for his father. Signy sends one after another of her sons out to aid him, and sacrifices them mercilessly when they show themselves craven and useless. At last she goes herself out, disguised and unrecognizable, to Sigmund's hiding place, and bears her own brother, a son, an avenger of the true type, instinct with a feeling of clanship. The war-skilled youth closed me in his arms. There was joy in his embrace, and yet it was hateful to me also. Runs the stirring old English monologue, and then at last the long-awaited vengeance comes, and the fire blazes up about King Sigir. She throws herself into the flames with the words, I have done all the King Sigir might be brought to his death. So much have I done to bring about vengeance, that I will not in any wise live longer. I will die now with Sigir, as willingly as I have lived unwillingly with him. To such a length is she driven by Firth. She cannot stop at any point in face of any horror, so long as her sisterly love is still unsatisfied. She is carried irresistibly through motherly feeling and the dead dread of incest. For there is not the slightest suggestion in the saga that Signy is to be taken as one of those stern characters whom one passion stifles all others from the root. One is tempted to regard this episode as a study, a piece of problem writing, has a conscious attempt to work out the power of Firth upon the character. The suggestion, I think, has something to justify it. The story as it stands has its idea, consciously or unconsciously, the poet and his hearers, where a concern to bring it about that the Firth on one side and that on the other, a woman's relationship to her husband, is also a sort of Firth where so forced one against the other, the two showered their power by crushing human beings between them. Signy must take vengeance on her husband for her father's death, in despite of humanity itself, and she must take vengeance on herself for her own act. Her words, so much have I done to bring about vengeance that I will not in any wise live longer, do not come as an empty phrase. They ring out as the very theme of the poem. Gudrun may sorrow for her husband, but she cannot take action against her brothers. Signy must aid in furthering vengeance for her father, even though it cost her her husband, and her children, and herself over. The Frith of the Guild statues, which requires the brethren to take up one another's cause, considering only the person and not the matter itself, is thus no exaggeration. And the Firth of Kinship has one thing about it which can never find expression in a paragraph of laws. To wit, spontaneity, necessity, the unreflecting, we cannot do otherwise. And whence comes this we cannot do otherwise? But from the depths that lie beneath all self-determination and self-comprehension. We can follow the idea of Firth from its manifestation in man's consciousness down through all his dispositions until it disappears in the root of will we dimly perceive that it is not he that wills Firth, but Firth that wills him. It lies at the bottom of his soul as the great fundamental element, with the blindness and the strength of nature. Frith constitutes what we call the base of the soul. It is not a mighty feeling among other feelings in these peoples, but the very core of the feeling that gives birth to all thoughts and feelings, and provides them with the energy of life. 
It is the center in the self where thoughts and feelings receive the stamp of their humanity, and are inspired with will and direction. It answers to what we in ourselves call the human. Humanity in them bears always the mark of kinship in our culture, a revolting misdeed as branded as inhuman, and conversely, we express our appreciation of noble behavior by calling it genuinely human. By the Teutons, the former is condemned as destroying a man's kin life, the later praised for strengthening the sense of frith. Therefore, the slaying of a kinsman is a supreme horror, shame, and ill fortune all in one, whereas an ordinary killing is merely an act that may or may not be objectionable according to circumstance. Down to this level of spontaneity, there is no difference between me and thee, as far as kinship reaches. If Firth constitutes the base of the soul, it is a base at which all kinsmen have in common. There they adjoin one another, without any will or reflection between them as a buffer. Kinsmen strengthen one another. They are not as two or more individuals who add their respective strengths together, but they are act in concert because deep down in them all there is of the thing in common which knows and thinks for them. Nay more, they are so united that one can draw strength to himself from another. The peculiarity of a man is well known by the bear, according to a saying current in the north of Sweden, better to fight twelve men than two brothers. It runs a proverb ascribed to the wise animal. Among twelve men, a bear can pick off one at a time in a rational fashion, but the two taken cannot be taken one by one, and if the one falls, his strength is passed on to his brother. This solidarity, as exemplified in the laws of revenge, rests on the natural fact of psychological unity. Through the channel of the soul, the action and the suffering of the individual flow, spreading out to all who belong to the same stock so that in the truest sense they are the doers of one another's acts. When they follow their man to the seat of justice and support him to the utmost of their power, they are not acting as if his deed were theirs, but because it is. As long as the matter is still unsettled, all the kinsmen concerned are in a state of permanent challenge. Not only the slayer stands in danger of perishing by the sword he is drawn, Vengeance can equally well be obtained by the killing of one of his kin. If the offended parties such find one easier to reach, or judge him more worthy, as an object of vengeance, Stingram's words have a most natural ring. When he comes to Julf Vagodesen, he tells that he has been out in search of Vermont, but being prevented, took instead his brother Hulf, who, from the saga, does not appear to have any share in Vermont's doings. Eof was not well pleased that it had been Vermin or Halls, another brother of Vermin's, but Stringham said they had not been able to reach Vermin, though he had rather seen it had been him. And Ulf likewise had no objection to this. The ring of the words, the passionless practical matter-of-fact tone in which the speeches are uttered, tells us at once, better than much roundabout explanation, that we have here to deal with a matter of experience, and not a reflection or an arbitrary rule. In another saga, man has to pay with his life for the amorous escapades of his brother. Ingulf had caused offense to Atta's daughter by his persistent visits to her home, and her father vindicated the honor of his daughter by having Ingulf's brother, Guduband, killed. Ingulf himself was too wary to give the girl's protectors a chance upon his life, and so they had no choice but to strike at him through the body of his kinsman. Similarly, all those united by one bound of kinship suffer by any scath to one of their clan. All feel the pain of the wound. All are equally apt to seek vengeance. If a fine be decreed, all have their share. Thus the kinsmen proclaim their oneness of soul and body, and this reciprocal identity is the foundation on which society, and the laws of society, must be based. In all relations between man and man, it is frith that is taken into account, not individuals. What a single man has done binds all who live in the same circle of frith. The kinsmen of a slain man appear in Plino as accusers. It is the clan of the slayer that promises indemnity, the clan that pays it. It is the clan of the slain man that receives the fine, and the sum is again shared out in such wise as to reach every member of the group. 
the two families promise each other, as one corporation to another, peace and security in future. When a matter of blood or injury is brought before the tribunal of the law thing, the decree must follow the line of demarciation drawn by kinship. The circle of Firth amounts to an individual, which cannot be divided save by amputation, and the right constitutes a whole which no judgment can dissect. Germanic jurisprudence knows no such valuation of an act as allows of distributive justice. It can only hold the one party entirely in the right, and the other entirely in the wrong. If a man has been slain, and his friends waive their immediate right of vengeance, and bring their grievance before the law court instead, the community must either adjudge the complaints their right of firth and reparation, or doom them from their firth, and declare them unworthy of seeking redress. In the first case, the community adds its authority to the aggrieved party's proceedings, thereby denying the accused all right to maintain their kinship or defend the aid the slayer. In the later case, when the killing was done in self-defense or on provocation, the law thing says to the complaints, Your firth is worsted. You have no right to vengeance. We have been taught from childhood to regard, regard the story of the bundle of sticks as an illustration of the importance of unity. The Germanic attitude of mind starts from a different side altogether. Here, unity is not regarding as originating in addition. Unity is first in existence. The thought of mutual support plays no leading part among these men. They do not see it in the light of one man after one coming with his strength and the whole and then adding together, but rather as if the force lay in that which unites them. For them, then, the entire community is broken, and the strength of its men therein, as soon as even one of the individual parties to it is torn up. And thus they compare the group of kinsmen to a fence, stave set by stave, enclosing a sacred ground. When one is struck down, there is a breach in the clan, and the ground lies open to be trampled upon. Such, then, is the firth, which in ancient days united kinsmen one with another. A love which can only be characterized as a feeling of identity, so deeply rooted that neither sympathy nor antipathy nor any humor or mood could make it ever flow. No happening can be so powerful as to reach down and disturb this depth. Not even the strongest feelings and obligations towards non-kinsmen can penetrate so as to give rise to an any inner tragedy, any conflict of the soul. Signy, to take her as a type, was driven to do what she would rather have left undone. The thrilling words, there was joy in it, but it was hateful to me also, are undoubtedly applicable also to her state after the consummation of her revenge. So near can the Northmen approach to tragedy that they depict a human being who suffers by taking action, for there is no question of any inner conflict, and the sense of her considering, in fear, what course she is to choose. The tragic element comes from without. She acts naturally, without hesitation, and her action whirls her to destruction. When first dissension between kinsfolk is consciously exploited as a poetic subject, as in the Laxadale account of the two cousins, driven to feud for a woman's sake, we find ourselves on the threshold of a new world. The Laxadolia plays about the tragic conflict in a man's mind when he is whirled in enmity to his cousin by the ambition of a woman. The strong-minded Gudrun is never able to forget that once she loved Kjatan and was yielded. And then she marries Boli, Kjatan's cousin. She makes him a tool of her revenge. At last the day of reckoning has arrived. Kjatan is reported to be on a solitary ride past Boli's homestead. Gudrun was up at sundown, says the saga, and woke her brothers. Such a metal as you are, you should have been daughters of so-and-so the peasant, of the sort that serve neither for good nor ill. After all the same Kjotun is put upon you, you sleep never the worse, for that he rides past the place with a man, or so. The brothers dress and arm themselves, and Goldrun bids Bali go with them. He hesitates, alle alleging the question of kinship, but she answers, maybe, but you are not so lucky as to be able to please all in a matter. We will part then, if you do not go with them. Thus urged, Bolly takes up his arms and goes out. The party place themselves in ambush in the defile of Hafagen. Bolly is silent that day, and lay up at the edge of the ravine, but his brothers-in-laws were not pleased to have him lying there, keeping lookout. 
Jestingly, they caught him by the legs and dragged him down. When Kjartan came through the ravine, the fight began. Bjorli stood idly by, his sword footbite in his hand. Well, kinsman, and what did you set out for today, since you stand there idly looking on? Bully, Bully made as though he had not heard Kjartan's words. At length the others make wake him to action, and he places himself in Kjartan's way. Then said Kjartan, Now you have made up your mind, it seems, to this cowardly work. But I had rather take my death from you than give you yours. With this he threw down his weapon, and Bjorli without a word dealt him his death blow. He sat down at once supporting Kjartan, who died in his arms. This, yes, no, I will, I will not, lies altogether outside the spear of Firth. In these chapters there is a touch of the medieval interest in mental problems, but the old, heartsick, and therefore at bottom ignoble melancholy still rings through. There is less of tragedy than a moral despair of Bolly's words to Guldrun when she congratulates him on his return home. This ill fortune will be long in my mind, even though you do not remind me of it. Frith, then, is nothing but the feeling of kinship itself. It is given, once and for all, at birth. The sympathy we regard as the result of an endeavor to attune ourselves to our neighbors has a natural premise, a feature of character. Compared with the love of our day, the old family feeling has a stamp of almost sober steadfastness. There is none of that high-pressure feeling which modern human beings seem to find vitally necessary to love. None of that pain of tenderness, which seems to be the dominant note in our heartfelt sympathy, between man and man, as well as between man and woman. The Christian hero of love is consumed by his adore. He is in danger of being sundered himself by his own need of giving out and drawing up in himself. The people of old time grew strong and healthy in the security of their friendships. Frith is altogether balance and sobriety. It is natural, then, that security should form the center of meaning in the words, which the Germanic people are most inclined to use of themselves, words such as sib and frith. Security, but with a distinct note of something active, something willing and acting, or something a leech which is ever on the point of action. A word such as the Latin pax suggests first and foremost, if I'm not in error, a laying down of arms a state of equipoise due to the absence of disturbing elements. Frith, on the other hand, indicates something armed, protection, defense, or else a power for peace which keeps men amicably inclined. Even when we find mention in the Germanic of making peace, the fundamental idea is not that of removing disturbing elements and letting things settle down, but that of introducing a peace power among the disputants. The translator of Anglo-Saxon poetry is faced with innumerable difficulties because no modern words will exhaust the meaning of terms like frithu, unsib, indicating firth. If he can tent himself with repeating peace again and again and again in every context, he will thereby wipe out the very meaning which gives sense to the line. Any have attempted to vary by differenting interpretations, he can only give the upper end of the meaning. He pulls off a little tuft of the word, but he does not get to the root. The energy of the word, its vital force, is lost. When in one place enemies or evildoers beg for frith, they word means fully, acceptance and a pardoning will, admission to involability, and when God promises the patriarch in Genesis frith, it bears the full meaning of grace. The earnest intention to be with him and protect him, to fight for him, and if need be, commit a wrong for his advantage, and is not only men, but also for instances, places, strongholds, which can furnish those in need of frith. And frith is the mutual will, the unanimity, gentleness, loyalty in which men live within their circle. According to the writer of the Anglo-Saxon Genesis, the state in which the angels live with their lord before they sinned was frith. It was this frith that Cain broke by his fratricide forfeiting love and frith. So also Mary says to Joseph, when he thinks of leaving her, you will rive asunder our frith and forsake my love. When Beowulf was killed, both Grendel and his mother, the Danish king, in graceful action says, I will give you my frith, as we had before agreed. And he can give nothing higher than this. But there's the same entire sense of affection and obligation 
when the two archenemies, Finn and Hengist, after a desperate fight, into the firm alliance and firth, even though the will gives way soon after. But the sense of the words is not exhausted yet. They denote not only the honest, resolute will to find loyalty, implicit trust, forms at the core, but about it lies a wealth of tones of feeling, joy, delight, affection, love, a great part of the passages quoted above. If not all are only half understood, unless that tone is suffered to sound as well. In the Anglo-Saxon, sib, or peace, ranges from the meaning of relief, comfort, as in the saying, sib comes after sorrow, to love, and when the Northmen speak of a woman's firth or love, the word glows with passion. We need not doubt but that the feeling of frith included love, and that kinsmen loved one another, and that deeply and sincerely it is love between one and another that has drawn the little old Scandinavian word zvas, Anglo-Svaxens ves, away from its original meaning. It means, probably at the first, approximately, one's own, or closely related. But in Anglo-Saxon poetry it shows a tendency to attach itself to designations for kinsmen, and at the same time its content has become more and more intense, intimate, dear, beloved, joyous. In the Scandinavian it is concentrated entirely about this sense, and is there, moreover, a very strong word for expressing dearness. From all we can see, the relationship between brothers, and also between brothers and sisters, was among the Germanic people, as generally with all peoples, of relative culture, one of close intimacy. The brotherly and sisterly relationship has a power, unlike any other, to intensify will and thoughts and feelings. The kinship has possessed both depth and richness. Besides love, there is in Firth a strong note of joy. The Anglo-Saxon word lis has a characteristic synthesis of tenderness and firmness that is due to its application to the feeling of kinship. It denotes the gentleness and consideration which friends feel for one another. It indicates the king's favor towards his retainers. In the mouths of Christian poets, it lends itself readily to express God's grace. But then Lys is also joy, delight, happiness, just the pleasure one feels in one's home, amongst one's faithful friends. These two notes, which were of course really one, rang through the words of Beowulf. All my Lys is in thee, but few friends have I without thee. Thus he greets his uncle, Hyglak, as if to explain the offering of his trophies to his kinsmen. All frith is ruined by the fall of fearless Tryggvason. These simple words disclose the boundless grief which Hafrid felt at the death of his beloved king. Gladness was a characteristic feature in a man, nothing less than the mark of freedom. Glad man, a man of happy mind, a man must be called. If the judgment were to be altogether laudatory, the verse in the Havamal, Glad shall a man be at home, generous to a guest, and gentle, indicates what is expected of a man. And this agrees that the spirit of the allowing following verse from the Beowulf, Be glad towards the Geats, and forget not gifts for them, as the queen adjures the king of the Geats. In fact, just as bold or well-armed are standing epithets of the man, Glad must be added to indicate that nothing is wanted in his full humanity. So when Beowulf tells us that a Frühe was betrothed to Frothi's glad son, the poet does not intend to explain the disposition of the prince, but simply describes him as the perfect knight. Gladness was an essential feature in humanity, and thus a quality of frith. The connection between joy and friendly feeling is so intimate that the two cannot be found apart. All joy is bound up with Frith. Outside it, there is not and cannot be anything answered to that name. When the poet of the Genesis lets the rebellious angels fall away from joy and Frith and gladness, he gives, in this combination of words, not a parallel reckoning up of the two or three most important values lost to them by the revolt, but the expression in a formula of life itself, seen from its two sides. Our forefathers were very sociable in their gladness. Intercourse and well-being were synonyms with them. When they sit about the board, or around the hearth, wherever it may be, they grow boisterous and quick to laughter. 
they feel pleasure. Pleasure, of course, is a word of wide scope of meaning in their mode of speech, extending far beyond the pleasure of the table and of converse, but pleasure is properly society. In other words, it is the feeling of community that forms the basis of their happiness. Man dream. Delight in man's society is the Anglo-Saxon expression for life, existence, and to go hence is called to give up joy, the joy in mankind, joy of life, joy of the hall, it is to forsake delight in kinsmen and honor in the earth, one's inheritance, the joyful sight of home. Now we are in our position to understand that gladness or joy is not a pleasure derived from social intercourse. It draws its exhilarating strength from being identical with frith. The contents of joy are a family privilege, an heirloom. The Anglo-Saxon word fithgaft means literally, he who has no part or lot with others. The outlaw who has no kin. But the word implies the meaning of unhappy joylessness, not as we might believe, because one so driven out must come to lead a miserable existence, but because he turned his back upon gladness when he went away. Gladness must be taken in an individualizing sense, as of a sum of gladness pertaining to the house, and which the man must leave behind him in the house when he goes out into the void. There is no joy lying about loose in the wilds. He who has cast out from gladness of his own, and those about him, has lost all possibility of feeling, the well-being of fullness in himself. He is empty. Kinship is an indispensable condition to the living of life as a human being, and it is this which makes the suffering occasioned by any breach in a man's frith so terrible, without parallel in all experience, so intolerable and brutal, devoid of all lofty ideal elements to us. A conflict such as that which arises in Gudrun when she sees her speech friend slain, and her brothers are the slayers. It might seem to present the highest degree of bitterness, a thing to rend the soul asunder. But the Germanic mind knew that which was worse than tearing asunder, to wit, dissolution. A breach of frith gives rise to a suffering beneath all passion. It is kinship itself, a man's very humanity, which is stifled, and thence follows the dying out of all human qualities. What the wretch suffers and what he enjoys can no longer produce any real feeling in him. His very power of joy is dead. The power of action is killed. Energy is replaced by that state which the Northmen feared most of all, and most of all despised. Redlessness. Bootless struggle, an overarching sin, falling like darkness over Heathrow's soul, says the Beowulf of the fatricide. In these words is summed up the helpless, powerless fear that follows on the breaking of Frith. This places a new task before us. Joy is a thing essential to humanity. It is inseparably attached to Frith, a sum and an inheritance, but this joy then containing something in itself. In the Beowulf, the hero's return from strife and toil is sung as follows. Thrence he sought his way to his dear home, loved by his people, home to the fair Firth Hall, where he had his battle fellows, his castle, his treasures. What did these lines mean to the original listeners? What feelings did these words, dear, loved, and fair, call forth in them? What we have seen up to now teaches us approximately what the strength of these words and what are we not to understand thereby? What were the ideals attaching to this joy? The answer is then contained in the old word, honor.